I almost wasn't going to do this video. It's, um, it's going to be different to what I normally do. We're going to talk about debasement of money supply. We're going to talk about inflation and we're going to interest rates, but in a way that I haven't spoken about before, in a way that the media doesn't tell you, in a way that only more sophisticated, very institutional investors, family offices, you know, investment banks think about the view of the world, including real estate. So if you, if you want to stop like seriously listening to your family and friends, and if you actually want to level up, like seriously consider your personal finances in a considered, analytical, more broad in your worldview sort of way, then continue watching. I'm not going to do my intro, but I just want to say, guys, that I appreciate you. You know, when I first started this YouTube, I would get like normally, I can see the YouTube analytics, like 80% likes, 20% dislikes, because I was talking about data. I was talking about not needing buyer's agents. I'm trying to challenge the status quo in real estate in Australia. And there was a lot of hate, right? There was a lot of hate. But year after year after year, we've proven that data works. We've proven that you don't need a buyer's agent. And we've proven to cut through the BS, okay? We've proven that. And now the likes versus dislike ratio is like 97, 98% versus 2, 3% every single video. So I just want to say either those buyers agents or old dinosaurs have gone or they have been converted. So I just want to say thank you for, for being with me. Let, let's start, okay? And the first thing that I want to tell you right now, and by the way, hit subscribe is this chart right here. Hit the subscribe button, turn the like button on right now because you won't have seen this chart, okay? It's from Procopolis Economics and this is like, I mean, even if you're brand new to, to property or you're a super sophisticated investor, just pause, okay? Just pause and understand what this chart is saying. It's saying about how important and how prevalent our debasing or the debasing of our currency is. Okay, let me explain that to you as you cast your eyes on this. Debasing of currency simply means that when you produce more of currency, i.e. money printing, that devalues it, that debases it. It's like saying, okay, I'm, you know, I'm currently running 100 meter sprint and I, you know, end up being number six. Okay, this year, next year, I end up being number five. Next year, I end up being number four. And the following year, I get the gold medal. And we're high-fiving, we're you know getting medals, all that sort of stuff. But in those five, six years, my competition has become poorer and poorer and poorer. My competition has become weaker, weaker and weaker. My competition has become slower and slower and slower. That is what is happening to our money supply. We think as property investors, we think as investors in general that we are, you know, doing really well. Actually, what's happening is that more and more money is being printed, not just recently, but forever. <laughs> I'll go through that in a second. And that is what is causing investment returns. Okay, but that doesn't mean that we're actually getting ahead. Actually, the competition is just getting poorer and poorer and poorer. Okay, we are climbing on top of the iceberg, but the iceberg is melting. So truly, we're not gaining any altitude much at all. All right, let, let's go through this. So ever since fiat currency started, fiat currency is basically when it was depegged or not linked to gold. You know, there's a whole history, but I won't go into that. It happened basically in Western countries around 1970, 1969-70, and that's when countries could decide basically by their money supply, how much money they would print or allocate or produce electronically what the cost or what the value of their currency was. So you can see the key thing that I'm trying to demonstrate, and, and stick with me guys, because you know I'm going to talk about whether it's the right time to buy property, I'm going to talk about interest rates, inflation, okay? You can see here that the, the United States money supply has doubled, okay, ever since it was um, started as fiat in 1969, every seven and a half years, okay? So every seven and a half years, there's been doubled an amount of money supply in circulation. China, every six years. Eurozone, every six and a half. Japan, every six. United Kingdom, over six. India, five. It was the most recent one, 2001. Canada, seven. All right. So like that's the worst so far. Um, Korea, 4.2. That's the best so far. Russia, 
um, uh, well, that actually, is, that's the worst. You know, they're, they're doubling every 4.2 years. That's worse than the others. Russia is the worst one so far now. Three Every three years, double the amount of money supply. Brazil, every one year. <laughs> okay, that's, I mean, pretty poor economy over there in terms of their currency in Australia, 6.3. Okay, so let's just understand that. So to take you through the mathematics, if the money supply is a doubling every six years in Australia, your investment returns need to be 12% per annum just to keep afloat. Your investment returns need to be 12% per annum, right, just to maintain status quo. Why? It's because the value of the underlying currency is being devalued. Okay, it's not like currency value is staying the same and then you get 12%, therefore you're going ahead. No, 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 that's not how it's working. It's like you're going forward on a treadmill, but obviously the treads are going back. So if you don't run fast enough, you're going to fall off the back. Okay, so think about money supply as that it's taking you backwards. All right, and if you've ever... Um, made less than 12% per annum in your investment returns, you know, you're going back, you're not keeping up with the treadmill, you're about to fall off the back and hit your head, okay, against the bar at the back. That is the reality. So the first point I want to make is that if you understand this concept, you will know that you need to, you must make at least 12% per annum. Where can you do that consistently, year after year after year? Where can you do that, Okay. You can only do that in real estate, okay? Stock market, yes, we've all made 20, 30 percent in the last one or two years, but you can't do that consistently. You can only do it in real estate because real estate allows you to leverage. Even though real estate over the long term has only gone up six or seven percent per annum, leverage that at 70, 80 percent, you've achieved 20 to 30 percent cash on cash return. So you're actually, you know, you're actually beating the treadmill. You're having to, you're needing to put the speed up on the treadmill because you're doing so well. That's the beauty of real estate. The second thing I want to mention, stick with me, hit subscribe if it's getting, giving you value, is about inflation. So you're like, what about inflation, right? Like, PK, this is all good. What about inflation? Doesn't all this additional money supply create inflation? Damn right it does, all right? That's exactly what it does. And look, inflation is a reality, and I think Western governments are obviously oftentimes blaming, you know, COVID supply chain bottlenecks or oftentimes blaming commodity price increases with this Ukraine war. Actually, that's all a cover up. Like, that's my humble opinion. If you actually look at the amount of gas, oil traded or exported out of Russia right now, it hasn't gone down since the war started. It stayed the same. It's just going into the West through the back door, like I said, through month, two months ago, through India, through China, through other um, currencies, through other countries. So actually, there's as much supply of oil as there was. It's being used as a scapegoat for Western democracies to justify inflation, which was actually their own wrongdoing. Why? Because of this currency debasement. Okay, like what I've just said is, is very non-mainstream. You're not going to hear it on property investment, um, smart property investment show or any of these mainstream providers in Australia. But this is the truth. Okay, this is the truth. And you need to understand this so you can actually leverage it to make money. Okay, to go faster on the treadmill. Okay, so what does that mean? People think that inflation means property prices come down. No, inflation means that things are rising in value. And I shared a chart with you about a few weeks ago. I'll link it right here as well. Every time there's been huge inflation in the global economy, in the local economy, property prices have gone up because property is also, you could say, a good all right. It's an essential good, but it's still a good that rises with inflation. So don't think that inflation means a huge recession is coming. It may or may not be coming. But inflation means that the cost of things rise, including property. OK, don't don't get that wrong. OK, don't don't kind of mess yourself up in your mind and think that, oh, these are negative things. Let me not invest. No, 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 no. Actually, hard, tangible in. Um, products or goods go up in value. Hard tangible is the secret, not necessarily stocks. Okay. All right. The next thing I want to talk about is interest rates. You're thinking, well, you know, that I sort of understand where you're going with this PK, but like surely interest rates are rising, right? And that means people are um, less able to hold on to their properties because mortgage repayments are increasing. Well, um, let me address that. 
the number one person or institution or organization that rising interest rates hurts the most is not you and me as property owners or property investors. It is the government because back to the original point, the people who took on the most debt by printing money, that is the government. Okay, so who does it hurt the most when interest rates go up? The government needs to pay coupons and needs to ultimately pay off the debt that they um, issued to central banks. If interest rates go up too much, then bank, then governments themselves find it difficult to pay those coupons, in other words, interest repayments, and pay the debt back to the central government, right? Who are the ones who bought those government bonds, who bought that debt off the government? So what do you think is going to happen? Who's, who's in control, right? Does the government have an incentive to make interest rates go up really high? No, it's shooting itself in the foot. Does the central banks, do the central banks, including the RBA, have an incentive to make interest rates go up super high? No, because then the government won't be able to pay it back. And so it's shooting itself in the foot. So understand how institutional investors think about the world. You and me, retail investors, you know, peasants in the scheme of things. Don't think that interest rates are going to 5%, 6%, 7%. They're definitely going to rise. And we all know that Australians have so much cash buffer, liquid cash. I've talked about that before, showed you RBA findings. I've definitely already told you that um, APRA, because of APRA, banks are um, working in a 2% buffer. So even if interest rates go up 2%, it doesn't hurt the average household. Okay, I've already told you that, but they will go up 1% or 2% because that's what the economy can handle. But then after that, it is not in the interest of the government and central bank or the banks to get interest rates higher because they're just shooting themselves in the foot. Okay, they're just shooting themselves in the foot. And if households can manage 1% or 2%, that's all that's required to cool this economy down. Okay, that's all that's required. Don't think that the neutral interest rate is 5 or 6%. Right now, we're at 0.1% or 1%. Maybe neutral is 1%. Maybe neutral is 2%. Maybe the new long-term average is 2.5%. But that doesn't cause a property crash. Okay, maybe in pockets of Sydney, Melbourne, it does. People who have overstretched themselves in, you know, first home buyers. But for Australia in general, it doesn't. All right, so this all begs the question, well, PK, like that's a lot of conceptual stuff, debasement, okay, treadmill analogy, iceberg analogy, inflation, interest rates. What is, where does that leave me? I'm thinking whether I should buy my investment property, my first or next investment property or not. What is the answer to that question? Well, let me ask that right back at you. Okay, you can either buy an investment property right now or wait. But what are you waiting for? Like, just ask yourself that. What are you waiting for? Are you waiting for inflation to go super high? In which time, by that time, property prices will be even higher because they're a good. Or are you waiting for the currency to debase itself even more? In which case you know, um, like you're just, you're dropping off the back of that treadmill because you are you haven't parked your money anywhere. There's just in the bank going backwards, right? You're falling off the treadmill. Okay, so is that what you're waiting for? Or are you waiting for interest rates to go up and the property market to crash? Well, I've just demonstrated that even a 1% or 2% increase in interest rates isn't going to crash the market, at least not in most places outside Sydney and Melbourne. So, like, what is it that you're waiting for? Like, your friends will be, sh you know, like, cramming misinformation down your throat, but just bring up these points and see if they have legible answers. Your colleagues, your, you know, family, see if they have legible answers to these critical and salient points. You know, what what are you waiting for, <laughs> right? Um, well, anyway, I'm not trying to spruik anything here, but this is just reality, and this is how institutional investors think about the world. Remember, anything that the media says, you know, just chuck it in the bin. Make your own mind up and make your own mind up through data and intel and macroeconomic intelligence. All right, if you do want to do that, um, I'll leave links below to the Facebook group where we talk about this all the time. We're not conspiracy theorists, guys. You know, we're not running in, um, you know, at night saying, I saw an alien and I'm, you know, all of a sudden I believe in aliens. Yeah, that, that's not what we're doing. This is just critical thought. This is critiquing the macroeconomic financial regulatory system and making the most of it for ourselves. Okay, that's what capitalism means. Taking care of ourselves. Okay. Don't hate the messenger, just hate the game. But level up, understand all this stuff, leave a link to the to the podcast as well. And and guys, you know, 
I just want you to understand this. If you want more videos on this kind of topic, it's very different to what I normally talk about. Leave a yes below, a Y-E-S below, and I'll, I'll talk more about it. Hopefully this video doesn't get too many haters. Hopefully that ratio, 97%, 3%, stays constant, but I don't care. You know, this is just me being as raw and authentic as possible. My name's PK. Catch you later. Bye.